I apologize. My voice, I'm a little, a little congested. It's that time of the year in Arizona, amen? So it's all good. It's all good. All right, I'm going to pick up where I've been. I've been going through the book of Ephesians, and I'm going to jump into the latter part, well, about the middle part of the verses. I'll be looking specifically at Ephesians 5, uh, 5, verses 15 through 21 um, here today. So last week, I, uh, today's message is redeem the time. So I'm talking to you about time management today. How many of you need a little better time management? The rest of you are doing great. Okay, that's good. So I, I think all of us could do a little better with time management. So We'll look at Paul's perspective on the importance of uh, time management. Last week I talked about walking uh, in the light, and verses uh, it was verses eight through fourteen, and just the importance of how we've come out of darkness. Jesus is the light of the world. Now we have become the light of the world. He says, "Now you are light in the Lord, so walk in as children of light. Walk uh, with Him, not participating in the unfruitful work of darkness." Right, and so. Uh, once we accept Christ and we are born again, now the scripture, again, exhorts us on how to walk. Not only not to walk in the darkness or participate in, in those behaviors, you know, that are mentioned in the scripture, but to walk in such a way that we take advantage of every opportunity in every day. You realize every day is a clean slate. You got 24 hours in every given day. Each one of us do, Right. And so we want to use that time wisely, and as we do, it, you know, we begin to live out of this place of closeness with the Lord, but we understand what the, the will of the Lord is, uh, we're not going to be wasting our time and, and have a, a better understanding of what his heart is. All right, so let's jump into Ephesians 5, verses 15 down through 21. He said, I'll read out of the New Living Translation. He said, so be careful how you live. Don't live like fools but like those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. Don't be drunk with wine, because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves and making music to the Lord in your hearts. And give thanks to uh, for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and further submit to one another out of reverence for Christ that could be a whole other message right there Peter talks in First Peter chapter 5 he says you younger be submissive to the elders but then he says elders but then he says this all of you be submissive one to another there's this place of working together in harmony and valuing uh, what we bring in in faith community and with one another so we need to be accountable and connected to one another amen so a little side journey there Ephesians 5 16 in the New King James Version t about time says this redeeming the time because the days are evil so again the title of the message is redeem the time so redeeming means to buy back if you will Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law he became a curse on that cross, carried our sin, carried our sickness, our sorrow, our disease, shed, carried that on the cross, died on the cross, rose three days later from the dead. He has bought us back from the just penalty of our sin. So that is an example of redeeming. But now Paul tells us we're to redeem or make every opportunity uh, of the time that we have because the days are evil. Now let's just talk about Paul's day and the evil, and we'll mention just for a moment our day. Evil surrounded the people in Paul's day, and we face the same dilemma. So here we are nearly 2,000 years later, and it's never been an easy time for the church because the church is the light in the darkness, and the darkness surrounds us. And so in every generation, every age, there have been periods of evil leaders there has been wars there's been famines there's been hardships there's been persecutions etc so that's just the reality of living in a in a world that's broken since the fall of man and sin entered the human race right so we must then learn to be careful and intentional about how we spend our time that's wisdom 
And the result is then we will understand God's will for our lives, and I'll get to that in a minute. But let me just share this with Paul. This is the last letter that Paul wrote with 2 Timothy, and he said this, and Paul being the senior apostle, if you will, writing to Timothy, who was the overseer at the church of Ephesus, and also an apostolic leader, he said this to Timothy in uh, chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. Uh, you should know this, Timothy, that in the last days there will be very difficult times. Now, the last days got inaugurated 2,000 years ago. Now, whether or not we're in the last of the last days, no one knows for sure. But he said, in the last days, it will be very difficult times. Verse 2, for people will love only themselves and their money. They will be boastful and proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents, and ungrateful. They will consider nothing sacred. They will be unloving and unforgiving. They will slander others and have no self-control. They will be cruel and hate what is good. They will betray their friends, be reckless, be puffed up with pride, and love pleasure rather than God. They will act religious, but they will reject the power that could make them godly. Stay away from people like that. Now, we're to be in the world, but not of the world. We're to reach out and make disciples in all the nations. And so that means we, we want to love people. We don't want to look at folks as you know, reprobates, we want to look at them as people that are broken. You and I are broken, but by the grace of God, right? And so, but we need to understand this is what is surrounding us. Yet, in our moment, the power of the gospel is still the gospel. And as I shared a little bit last week, irrespective of cultural norms that are anti-biblical in most cases, the power of the gospel is still the power of the gospel to set at liberty those who are held captive by doctrines that are contrary to what God has said in his word. Does it make sense? And so that's what we have to hold on to. So we need to understand that there are many that have a portention, if you will, of religion or that they're right with God or after all, God loves everybody. And I've shared this before. It's known as universalism and it's contrary to what the Bible says. God loves everyone, so that means everyone will be in heaven, right? No. Yes, God loves everyone, and God gave his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, that whoever would believe on him would not perish it, but have everlasting life. So that is the truth of the gospel. But the reality is, just being good doesn't make us right with God. It is coming into a place of realizing Jesus Christ paid the penalty for my sin, your sin, the sin of all humanity. He died on the cross and he rose again from the dead. And when that happens in a person's heart, if you shall confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. That's what it means to be born again. That's what it means to be made right. That's the power of the gospel. But the darkness doesn't like this. And the darkness would want us to believe you need to be inclusive of everyone, and we do. And you need to accept everyone's behavior to an degree, we do. But what the problem comes in is when they try to make us think you need to accept everyone's value system and belief system. No, no. We, we, everyone is welcome, but it's only through Jesus Christ can one be liberated and be right with God. It's the power of the gospel that breaks us out of the deception of evil times. Paul tells us to redeem the time. The days are evil. To Timothy, in the last days there will be difficult times. So it's important for us to understand this is the reality, but despite the difficult times, we are to persevere for Jesus Christ. You realize adversity is merely an opportunity for God. You know, by the way, God's not wringing his hands over the darkness. He said that this would happen, 
But Jesus said, okay, I'm the light of the world. My light is in you. Live as children as light, as I shared last week. Now go let your light shine. You see, it's in the darkness that the light shines the brightest. And it's in the darkness, <coughs> excuse me, that we should expect God's power and his glory to touch a world. In fact, it's often when times are the darkest throughout the history of the world that we see the greatest outpourings of the Holy Spirit or times of spiritual revival and awakening. Amen? We're in a great moment of opportunity. Remember Nehemiah rebuilding the wall around Jerusalem? They were children of Israel, were led captive to Babylon, and they began to, to go back and eventually rebuilt the temple rebuilt the wall around Jerusalem, but there was all this adversity against Nehemiah to rebuilding the wall around Jerusalem. You know that there's never the right time, only God's time. And so, it, it, look, we live in a dark moment, we live in a challenging moment, but it was a challenging moment in Paul's day as well. There's never the right time to stop and share your faith with someone. There's never the right time to, to help a neighbor out or someone in need. There's never a right time to be the good Samaritan. There's only Jesus' time, and Jesus often interrupts our time. Now, I don't know about you, but I like to-do list. Don't look at me as though I said some foreign thing, okay? <laughs> now, maybe you don't like a to-do list, but let's flip face facts. All of us have to-dos, right? Here's the problem, especially if you're a very organized, type A type personality. You got your to-do list, and so you have your time schedule. And all of a sudden, if God comes along and interrupts, or someone calls, or texts, or whatever, it may not fit your schedule. Everybody say, it's God's time. <laughs> Even during hardship and adversity. You know, back in the early 90s, nearly 30 years ago, Carol and I were getting ready to go as missionaries down to Haiti. And God had been speaking some things to us and really felt that this may be the Lord, but we weren't entirely sure yet. And at the time, her and I were living in an apartment complex, and it's kind of an interesting thing. We were in our early 30s, and we were in a 55 and older apartment complex. <laughs> a very unique experience. Uh, I guess it was prophetic of where anyway, so... Uh, and I was taking the trash out one day to the big green dipsy dumpster. And, you know, in central Florida there, you get these big cumulus clouds, you know, and that type of thing. And it's beautiful. And I'm getting ready to throw the trash in the dumpster. And I look up in the sky, and these clouds, the way they formed, it, it looked like there was a door. It was really interesting. I just stopped there and looked at it for a minute. And all of a sudden, I heard the Holy Spirit just say to me, he goes, there's a door of opportunity for you to go to Haiti right now. I want you to step through that door. And then he said this, Haiti is the stepping stone to the nations and the call of God that I have in your life. I said, what, Lord? And that was it. And all of a sudden, the clouds just kind of, you know. And so we eventually, we responded. We prayed more. There was more confirmation, and, and we went. And it was God's plan, and yet it seemed like a challenge. It was a challenge. At that time, Haiti was in total chaos. It's still having struggles. The UN had, UN had come in, and, you know, one of the leaders there, Aristide, he had been set down. There was corruption, chaos in the streets. There was factions fighting one another and just all kinds of stuff. Yet it, for God, it was his time, his moment, and for whatever reasons, he wanted us in the nation of Haiti for that season of time in our life. Amen? Amen. And so we may not understand when what we think is the right time, but it's only God's time. Amen. Time is one of our most precious assets. There's an ancient mariner proverb, time and tides wait for no man. The simple meaning is, like the tide, time continues to change, and there are only windows of opportunity to act. If you wait, you might miss the opportunity. So whether it's tides, boats, and fishing, that it, it all has to do with, you know, opportunity. Farmers also understand this, too, with the seasons, planting and harvest. The writer of Ecclesiastes says this in Ecclesiastes 3, 1 and 2, For everything there is a season, a time for every activity under heaven, a time to plant, and a time to harvest, right? So we have to understand the seasons. You know, I'm from the Midwest in, my, in Iowa, and my grand, on my mom's side, my grandfather and grandmother had a big dairy farm. So they... You know, lots of cows, pigs, chickens, all kinds of stuff. But they also, wrote, you know, grew corn and 
in hay and uh, soybeans in particular. And so there was always that tenuous moment. As I got older, I talked to my grandfather about it, you know, because you, you want to plant. You don't, if you wait too long to plant in the spring, you won't have the right moment for the harvest, right? So you, but you've got to take some risk to plant in the spring because you may get another frost or you may get rains that could create problems, right, or floods. So there's always this element of risk, but you've got to know the season that you're in and plant accordingly, expecting a harvest. You know, I saw a movie when I was, uh, actually just before we went down to Haiti, this is how long ago, 1989 movie, Dead Poets Society with the late Robin Williams. How many of you ever see, saw that? And uh, he played the role of passionate English teacher John Keating in an Ivy League prep school for boys. And so Robin Williams playing this role of Mr. Keating, he's got the boys in this lobby area. They're looking into this, these trophy cases. And you see these trophies and you see these pictures of classes of kids that have gone on before them like a hundred years before them. And it's just, it just grips you, this scene, right? And all of a sudden, he, like this wide sage, he says to these young men, they're not that different from you are, are they? Same haircuts, full of hormones, just like you. Invincible, just like you feel. The world is their oyster. They believe they're destined for great things, just like many of you. Their eyes are full of hope, just like you. Now, again, he's talking about pictures of guys from 100 years before. Did they wait until it was too late to make from their lives even one iota of what they were capable? Because you see, gentlemen, these boys are now fertilizing daffodils. But if you listen real close... You can hear them whisper their legacy to you. Go on, lean in, listen. You hear it? Carpe. Hear it? Carpe. Carpe diem. Seize the day, boys. Make your lives extraordinary. Carpe diem is a Latin phrase meaning seize the day. You see, the truth is all of us one day are going to pass. Again, we were reminded of that this week with our dear brother John. But the richness of the life we live today and the legacy we leave tomorrow is going to be determined by whether we can overcome our fears, our hurts, and our failures from the past and find the strength and courage to be the extraordinary person we were created to be. You realize you were created to be something greater than what maybe your human experience is testifying to you about? You are a supernatural being by the grace of Jesus Christ. You are born again anew. Your spirit is united with his spirit. You're an eternal being now having a temporary earth experience. You're just passing through. I'm just passing through. We're here for a short time. We have moments each day. Make the most of the day. You're the only person who can seize your day and redeem the time. You must wisely use time and learn to live in God's will to fulfill your purpose and calling. The first step is to be born again, to repent of sin, receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. We can be successful without Christ, but separated from God without hope in this world. There are many successful people that have never accepted Jesus Christ or been born again, but without Christ... We are not forgiven of our sin, and we do not have hope beyond the grave. Only Jesus Christ. So let's talk about some principles to redeeming the time. Again, we want to wisely invest time. It's our greatest resource. First, the first principle, invest time according to God's will. We can be busy but not accomplishing what God intends if we don't know his will. So we can, you know, use our time unwisely. Have you ever sat down to maybe, if you, when you were back in school, to maybe write a paper or do something you needed to, you know, get some homework done or something, and you started moving everything around on the desk? You know, you readjusted this, moved the pens this way, did that, got your paper all nice and neat, did all that, put some music on. Oh, wait, I need a snack. Got up, go get the snack. I mean, I need a drink, too. Okay, get, get a drink. You come back. Move the pens a little bit more. You maybe draw a sentence down. Okay, I'm not the only one, right? And then... And then, you know, and next thing you know, an hour has gone by and you've not really done much. Don't feel guilty, okay? 
We've all done it. Or here's the one. You've, you've gone out to clean the garage, <laughs> only to find out the basketball game is way more interesting, okay? So it's all happened, right? We can get distracted and not be doing what we should be doing, and yet it seems like we're busy. Sometimes we can be busy in all this activity, but we're really not doing what God wants us to do. In our Ephesians passage, Paul tells us plainly, this is my paraphrase, use your time wisely, the days are evil. Don't waste your time living carelessly. Rather, be filled with God's Spirit to know His will and, and pursue that. So now let's look at Romans 12 too, because Paul gives us another hint of this in his letter to the Romans about knowing the will of God and linking this with time. He says, first of all, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world. So again, we've come out of the darkness, live as children of life, don't copy their customs and behavior because it's probably contrary to the, what the Word says. Let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will, know, you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. So again, it's transformation of the mind that enables us to understand, begin to understand God's will for our life. So as we come out of the darkness, we begin to live in the light, we allow our mind to be transformed, we begin to understand the purposes of God. If you are copying the behavior and customs of this world, you won't know the will of God for your life. It will be distorted. Allow the Holy Spirit to change your thinking to align with God's word and nature. So the Holy Spirit is our greatest teacher, right? He will take the word, make it come alive, and illuminate to us, to, and we begin to understand it. Then we begin to live out of the reality of what God says with a transformed mind. Then we'll begin to understand his will for your life. This is fundamental uh, as being a Christian. So what um, should have the greatest effect on our thinking? Should it be the news media or secular teachers? Should the university dictate what gender is? Or should it be God's ways as revealed in Scripture? What is God saying? That should be the baseline of our thinking. You see, you don't know the truth of any situation until you've heard from Jesus, right? Now, lest you think that I'm, you know, anti-education, I have a doctorate degree. No, I'm all for education. But much of education is distorted, okay? What is being passed off as science is often pseudoscience, all right? Where there's enough, oftentimes there's as much, if not more, evidence on the other side than what often is getting pushed on us, okay? And so understand what we really need to know, what is God saying and what is the truth of the situation? So we have to guard our hearts and minds, Proverbs 4.23, to ensure that we're focused on his leading and God's will for our life, right? All right, second principle uh, to really using time wisely, invest time in the lives of others. And this is a really important one. We are to be imitators of God, as we talked about a couple weeks ago. God is love, God is kind, and it's easy to lose sight of the value of love and relationships. We must invest time in the love and relationships. Again, Jesus loved Everyone, everyone, people were drawn to him. The tax collectors, the sinners, the, the broken of society, those in the margins, God, even those, <coughs> excuse me, that were sick, that, um, you know, lepers couldn't just enter the, the congregation. So it wasn't just a physical separation that was happening. There was a spiritual disconnection from the faith community. What did Jesus do? He hugged the lepers. He, he prayed for, he prayed they'd be cleansed, Right? And so all, there's, there's a restoration there. He would invest in the lives of others. But Jesus, it was always, come to me as you are and let my love and my word transform you. Even the leopards that he cleansed, he says, okay, now go and show yourself, yourself to the priests based on Levitical law that you've been healed. So he goes, he goes, I didn't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law, right? He came full of grace and truth. So we want to love and accept everyone, absolutely, and invest into them, but we want them to understand the truth of what his word says and the liberating power of his grace, right? Jesus said it was more blessed to give than to receive. So marriages, families, friendships, business relationships, people we meet, we want to pour our time into kingdom relationships 
that will build people and expand the kingdom, uh, expand the kingdom and uh, leave a legacy. Legacy matters. You know, again, our brother John uh, that passed this week, John Gates, you know, one of the things in just the short time that, that he was with us, uh, I, he just got so enwrapped in our men's ministry and involved in the, in the faith community with a lot of our younger people especially. But what I loved about John, not only was his heart and his love for Jesus and his worship, but he was a servant. He would come early at that men's breakfast and, and, and set up and cook and, and did that for, for 5.30 in the morning on a Saturday. What young man does that? except one who loves Jesus. And so he's pouring his life into, right, serving others, and now we will never forget it. He's passed on, and we're sad. We we grieve his loss. But we will remember what he did. I remember that last breakfast. It was good, okay? (laughs) See, that's what we want. We want to leave a legacy, pouring into the lives of others. We must build in the lives of our children. That, that's understood. We build in them the expectation for a future. You see, hope is one of our greatest gifts we can give them. In the midst of dark and evil times, there is always hope. There is always hope. That's the essence of the gospel of the good news. I get disturbed just like you about some of the the legislation and things that's before our state government and things that are happening around the nation. I talked a lot about some of that last week. It grieves me. But I want to I portray that there's always hope. There's always light in the darkness, right? We can be a voice and we can make a difference, right? We can stand against the, the schemes of the enemy that's working in a cultural way and even in a governmental way to bring on legislation that is just insane, Okay? Jesus holds his own close to heart. He never leaves us for the slightest slightest moment. So we need to impart this as a living truth in the hearts of others. Thirdly, invest time in today. Don't worry about tomorrow. How many of you worry about tomorrow? Oh, don't raise your hand. (laughs) Because I probably get about 90% of the hands, okay? Listen, we've all worried about tomorrow. But let's invest time in today, okay? Jesus said this in Matthew 6, 31 through 34 love this passage. He says, so don't worry about these things. They were concerned about food, clothing, all this stuff, right? Don't worry about these things saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. So don't worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. God promises to give us everything we need. Not everything we want, but everything that we need, right? And so what's the, what's, what does he tell us here? What's the, I, I will hate to say formula, but what is, what's the steps here? He says, well, seek God first. Live righteously. Live from an intimate faith and trust in God, right? Trust Him for today. Trust Him for tomorrow. Live close to Him. Live lightly with Him. And what does He promise? I'm going to give you everything that you have need of. Uh, Someone needs to hear that today. I'm going to give you everything that you have need of. I know the gas prices have gotten high again. I know the price of food is still high. God says, I'm going to give you everything that you have need of, church. Amen? Amen? Seek Him first. Live rightly with him, walk with him closely, live from a place of trust in him, and believe that God's going to provide it, right? So our focus needs to be on today. Ask the Lord, okay, Lord, where do you want me to concentrate my energy today? Is there something special you've got for today, whatever? Sometimes God will redirect, and just let him and be open to those divine interruptions. You never know on what's going to happen or how he's going to redirect. It can be extremely uh, exciting. Is Sherry in the room that, that shared the testimony about, I don't so sure if she's here. Okay, that's all right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share this. I don't think she'd mind. Uh, Sherry, one of our ladies, just went and shared Jesus with a whole bunch of people down on 
down on the south side of town. And I just thought this was just amazing. So uh, this got put out on our, our prayer net thing. But let me just share you a couple of these testimonies. Just being open to God. Uh, Sherry prayed, I guess, last week for people on a bus bench. I just have to share this. I was driving home on 6th Avenue and 44th Street. At a bus stop, there was a young girl in a wheelchair with her face on her lap. There were about six other people there also. The Lord said, go pray for her. This is living in the moment and just loving Jesus and being obedient. I kept driving. Then he said again, go pray for her. I turned around and went back. I parked my car and went up to the bus stop and asked if I could pray for the young girl. The gentleman said, oh, yes, and can you pray for all of us? They all looked at me with pleading in their eyes. So I prayed for all of them as the bus drove up. I almost missed it. People want Jesus. They are hurting, sick, and sad. And then she shared another one. This is a follow-up. Sam, I had to share this with you. This Pastor Sam, he put this out there. The same bus I was prompted to stop at before I was prompted again. A homeless man gave his life to the Lord, and afterwards a peace came upon him. I asked if he sensed it, and he said, oh, yes. Another lady there asked for prayer for her marriage and for her mother that had cancer. The Holy Spirit moved so strongly that she could feel it. There was another lady that only spoke Spanish but knew when I put my hands together as a sign of praying, she shook her head yes. Another young man wanted prayer also. Everyone there wanted prayer. Glory to God. Now, I don't know where this bus stop is on the south side, but revival's happening there. Because because one dear lady in our con- said, okay, Lord, you want me to stop? I'll stop, okay? Will you stop for the one? Maybe we need to have a Tucson bus stop revival. I don't know, so... But all I know is when we allow God to divinely interrupt our plans and we're just obedient to him, marvelous things can happen. Praise be to God, right? Listen, I got a question for you. What season are you in in this season of your life? Or what season are you in today? It's an important question to ask and understand. Uh, Yet realize there may not ever be a perfect moment to act in faith. Remember the farmer, right? They've got to take some risk. They believe, okay, uh, I think the, uh, the second week in April is when we should plant, okay? they got to take some risk and plant that seed in the ground in the Midwest, right? Trusting there's not going to be another freeze. or There's, there's got to be, you know, you pray, you, see, you do what you can, you look at the science, etc. Boom, you move ahead, right? And so there rarely is a perfect moment. Remember Nehemiah, the story about rebuilding the wall. He sensed a moment to take others back there and do this. There was a divine invitation. God was moving on him. He had to respond, yet in the natural, everything seemed contrary. When we built this new sanctuary building, we started the process back about in 2008 or 2007, actually, trying to work with the city to move an easement and everything back here. And I think most of you remember what happened in 2008, the Great Recession, right? And so it was, I am not exaggerating, I finally got the city, the county to agree on moving the easement, they signed off it. I was down at the, the, the uh, courthouse building downtown. They were excited. I mean, I've never seen city and county officials, like, you know, excited about something like this, you know. I walk out of there. I'm elated. I'm one week later, the financial crisis of 2008 happens. And the bank that we've been working with, that we had the original mortgage, you know, we were working to get a construction loan. You know, of course, I call them, and I already knew, and the banker was like, Pastor Bob, nobody anywhere is lending money for the foreseeable future, right? And so all of this stuff, we went through 2008, through the holidays, just kept praying, seeking God. I'm out walking by the old sanctuary, which is now the youth facility out there. And, of course, this is just was a parking lot that's here right now. I'm out walking in January 2009, and, and you know, people still didn't know. The stock market's still going down. What's going to happen? Is it going to be another Great Depression, whatever? And I heard the Lord say, I want my building built. You see, there's never our time. There's only God's time. And I tell you, it stretched everything within me, within Pastor Carolyn, our elders, leaders. Uh, It just did not seem the right time. And boy, I worked my tail off trying to get financing. We ended up having to sell church bonds. It's the only way we could do it. The interest rate was way higher. But everybody say, but God, okay? 
This building's a miracle building. The contractor ended up, con yeah, go on, give, me, give the Lord a hand cap. He did it. Uh, you know, we had to borrow money. I'd like to, you know, I'm still believing one day it's going to all be paid off. Uh, but, you know, the Lord did it through a very, very difficult time. And uh, because we said yes. And then I was thinking here recently, think about all the inflation this past year. And I was thinking the other day, I said to somebody I was having lunch with, I said, can you imagine if we tried to build this building, let's say, you know, at this time right now, this would probably have cost three to four times as much as it did back then. So while at the time it seemed like the worst time to build a building, it was actually a really good time to build a building because of the cost of things now, right? See, how, So we just, you just can't figure this stuff out with God. All you can do is walk with him closely, listen to what he says, and then obey, right? And it's always live today, don't worry about tomorrow, right? Now, I, look, I had some sleepless nights. That night the contractor called, uh, I think it was in 2011. Yeah, it was the spring of 2011 because we finished this building in in uh, December of 2011, had our first service Christmas Day 2011. He calls me, I mean, it's actually it was in April, and uh, I'm at a conference in, in uh, Colorado, and he calls me and says, Pastor Bob, I've got bad news. I've gone bankrupt. I can't finish the church building. I'm not going to tell you I didn't have some sleepless nights. But God, everybody, right? Stay close. He'll get you through, whatever the through is, Okay. First Chronicles 12.32, sons of Ishakar understood the times they were in. They had understanding of the times and the seasons. Yet Jerusalem, the people of Jerusalem in Jesus' day when he was there, he, Jesus said this in Luke 19.44, you did not recognize the time of your Messiah's visitation. Much of the people didn't understand the Lord is right here with us. The Lord is moving. Listen, church, if you have faith to believe it, Jesus is walking these streets right now. Today is the day of salvation. Paul would say, 2 Corinthians 6, 2, I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. Jesus said to the woman at the well in John 4, the fields are ripe now for harvest. Amen. We wait for the right time or what we think is the right time, but Jesus is saying, are you willing to stop at a bus stop? Are you willing to pray for someone in Walmart or the supermarket? I remember one time we, at Christmas, you know how Christmas is, how busy it is at Walmart, and, and there was a couple behind us, and the, and the Lord said, I want you to pray for him. I didn't even know what was going on. So we, we wait till they get through the checkout line, and we stop. Turns out he was going blind in one of his eyes, and he had to go see the doctor the next day. And I don't know what happened, but we stopped, and we prayed for them as a family, and they just, tears were coming down, there, him and his wife, and their little ones, and, and they just thanked us so much. for You never know how God will use you if you just stop and, and just be ready, right? Okay, number four, invest time for your future. So we don't worry about tomorrow, but we also invest in tomorrow, right? Realize your tomorrow begins today. Life is a journey, so understand what you do today affects your tomorrow. Have you ever noticed that you never stop learning in life? For all your older people, don't you love all these fun apps on these smartphones, right? I saw a funny thing on CBS News the other night. There's a group of high school students helping a retirement center, I think down in, in Florida, down near Fort Myers, and they're going and show, showing all the people how to get their computers working right. They're so, you know, they're, and the, the folks are so excited. You know you're getting older when you want someone to help you with your apps, okay? So... But you never stop learning, right? So commit yourself to daily growth in the Lord. Get education. Get training. Ask God how you can better prepare for what he has called you to or is bringing you into. So, Lord, how do I need to prepare for what you have? I'm still doing it. I, I've not arrived. I said, Lord, is there something else I need to learn, something else I need to study, something you want me to see, prepare for? Lord, what, what is that, right? Just be open. Last point on this, and I'm almost done for today. Invest time for eternity. All of us are presently eternal beings who one day will depart from this earthly realm. Sow your life. And by the way, I had prepared this message weeks ago before John's passing this week. Sow your life into eternal pursuits for God's kingdom. Amen. Invest your life in the lives of others. That brings eternal fruit leading others to Christ, making disciples, praying for the sick, ministering to the poor, helping the needy, 
Jesus said, as much as you do it to the least of these, you have done it to me, right? We want to help those who are in the margins of society. We want to love them. We want to help them know that Jesus, his room at his table and in his house, we want to help and minister to everyone and trust the Holy Spirit to bring about the changes that need to happen in folks' lives. So remember, you are a spiritual being having a temporary human experience. Live for eternity. Live in that way. So as I close here, I want you to be intentional every day about seizing your day, redeeming the time. Your time, your life matters. Listen, if you're here and maybe you feel like you've had some huge mistakes in life or setbacks or maybe you've missed some key moments in your life where you could have got training or whatever, it, I want you to hear this. It's never too late with God. I don't know how it is and how in his divine economy and how he works all things together for the good, Romans 8, 28, but he can. All he's waiting for is our yes. So even if we miss a season, if we come and say, okay, Lord, I may have missed that moment. Lord, can you redeem it? Can, we, can, can, we, can I get back to where I, I need to be? And God will work it. It may not be the fullness of what could have been, but it, he'll bring you back to what, what he intends. You believe that, right? Amen. So listen, don't just let your day slip away. Don't just sit and watch TV all day or just get on the Internet all day. You pour into each day. Again, the first step, as I said earlier, is to repent of sin, receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. We can be successful without Christ, but again, separated from God and without hope in this world. The second step is after we've accepted Christ is to be intentional about growing in Christ. Reading, studying God's Word, continuing steadfastly in prayer, prayer with others, growing, right? learning, being in that faith community. So we begin to know the mind and will of Christ. Next, third step, learn to obey the leading of the Holy Spirit. Again, as I've shared some of this, and by the way, the message after uh, Easter Sunday, I'll be talking about, you know, being led of the Spirit or being filled with the Spirit. And so I'll get into more of that then. And then uh, lastly, as I've shared some, build relationships with others in community. Be accountable you know, to each other, one another, right? Get in groups, small groups. Allow others to help disciple you, help disciple one another, grow together. Find a place to serve in the body of Christ. I once heard a pastor say this, and, and it really rubbed me raw at the wrong time. This was years ago, back in Florida. They said, if you want to really get to know me, come alongside of me and serve with me. Now, the thing is, her idea of serving was fixing old buildings. Oh, I love that. Doing renos. Okay, to all of you guys that like to do repairs, thank God for you. I love you. I, I need your help, okay? It's one of my weak areas. Uh, but you know what? As time went on, I began to understand what she meant. She wasn't trying to get me to just paint, you know, and fix things. She was saying, listen, you want to get to know me? Come, let's serve together, right? And she was the wife of the senior pastor and was one of the pastors in the church. And, and Rodney was more of a businessman, but uh, respected both of them. But there is a truth in that. As we work together, as we do life together, as we pray together, as we, as we grow together, we're in small groups together, all of a sudden something happens. So when you, whether you're serving in some area in the church, you're growing with others, you're, you're building community. This helps us understand what the will of God is and being right where he is today. Would you go ahead and stand? I want us to pray a prayer today about time and um, so if you feel led I'm going to lead us through a, a prayer of repentance for time management okay <laughs> repent today for allowing time to slip away and we're going to ask God to empower us to live in the fullness of each day he gives so just repeat after me father forgive me for not using my time wisely With your help, I choose today to live according to your revealed will, in your word and the leading of the Holy Spirit. I choose to invest my time wisely in my life, the life of others, and for the furtherance of God's kingdom. In Jesus' name. Father, I pray right now for your people. I pray, God, Lord, we break off any condemnation of the enemy for time that has been lost or maybe not spent in the best way. Lord, I thank you. You can redeem all things. God, Paul told us in the one translation to redeem the time. So, Lord, I'm asking for supernatural help 
to, for redemption of time, God, where time has been lost so that we can invest it wisely. And God, I pray for a large return on the investment of good time that people sow into their lives, their family, into the kingdom of God, that Jesus, you would be glorified in all things. Amen and amen. Yes, God is good. And so, again, if you're here and you don't know the Lord, we have a prayer team up here. Be happy to pray with you and pray a prayer with you to accept Christ. If you need prayer for healing, please, by all means. And by the way, keep our dear brother uh, Bud in prayer. We prayed for Bud last week that's battling the pancreas. Still problems with kidney functions that was being taken to the ER room today. So keep Bud in prayer. We're believing for his healing. Amen. If you need prayer, come on up here. and.